Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Fredland, excited to bring you just another episode of the podcast. Quick shout out to Running Aces, who is our official sponsor of the Rec Poker Podcast. Just appreciate your support and what you guys got going on there. Also, a quick shout out to the Free Poker Network, who is also supporting what we're doing with the podcast. So today we're going to mix it up a little bit again. Uh, We're going to look at a specific hand scenario. And this is one of the hands that uh, came out of my experience out in Las Vegas. And so we're going to break that down. i got a bunch of folks that have provided some input, some recreational players, some professional players. And uh, it's going to be a good mix of people. And the idea here is just to... For you guys to consider how would you play in this situation, what are the things that you would consider, and then listen to all of the different perspectives on what people are considering and the decision that they would make, and integrate that into your game. What do you like? What don't you like? But I think it's important just to understand that there are many ways to think about a hand, and there are different things that people are considering. Even when they reach the same decision, a lot of people are thinking about the hand in different ways, and I think that can give us recreational players great insight into some things that maybe we're not quite thinking about right or not even considering or not giving the proper amount of weight to. So hopefully you enjoy this uh, this structure. I would love your feedback on Twitter at Rec Poker or the Facebook group Rec Poker or email me directly stevefredland at gmail.com. And I'd love your feedback on do you like this sort of approach? Do you not like this sort of approach? And if you want to engage and be part of uh, the group that's providing feedback, uh, let me let me know through one of those channels also, and we'll get you involved as well. So, without further ado, uh, here is the scenario, and I did try to write this out and put this in the uh, show notes so you can review it ahead of time. Maybe pause here and take a look at the scenario and think it through what you would do before hearing the the other feedback uh, from the other folks. But here's the scenario. Uh, I was playing uh, the Daily Deep Stack out in the World Series of Poker. So it's a $185 tournament. This is the 5 o'clock Deep Stack and uh, half-hour blind levels. And we had 270 entrants, and we were down to the uh, the final 35. So 41 people got paid. We're down to the final 35. So we are in the money at this point. Now, the stacks are pretty shallow. We had a chip average of 77,000, and the blinds were... Uh, 3,000, 6,000 with an ante of 500. So the average stack was only about 13 big blinds. So the big blinds at 6,000, 77,000 chip average. And I just got moved uh, into a new table. So we had just split tables. Uh, I think I had about two hands at this table. Uh, so I really I don't know any of the players. I really don't know what people are doing um, and that sort of thing. So we have 70,000 chips. So we have about 12 big blinds. Uh, just under the tournament average. We are in the money, and I am in the big blind. So here's the way that the hand goes down. Uh, Again, the blinds are 6,000. So it folds around to an older gentleman, about 60 years old, and he's in middle position. Uh, And he has about 90,000 in chips, and he just limps. He just calls the 6,000 big blind. And then it folds around all the way to the small blind, And there's a 40-year-old guy in the small blind. He has about 50,000 chips, and he just calls. He just completes the big blind. And so it comes to us in the the big blind. We've had two limpers now in front of us, one from middle position, one from the small blind. And we pick up ace-jack offsuit, and we have 70,000 chips. So I guess the first question that I ask folks is, you know, what would you do? What's the correct pre-flop play? And then I also asked... uh, What are some of the considerations? What are some of the, if this hand was a little bit different, what are some of those things that would actually change how you would have approached what you did in this situation? And then just ask them to provide any other considerations and insights. So first of all, think about what you would do in that spot. And now let's go to some of the feedback that I got. So I received feedback from Hunter Sitchi, who I did interview not too long ago. Some of you are familiar with Hunter as a, as a native Minnesotan, now living in Florida, uh, a professional, very well respected. He runs Check Shove Poker. And the first things he said, uh, and this is if you heard the prior podcast with him, this won't surprise you. He said, I have a couple of uh, notes on situational awareness, as we talked about in our last podcast. 
you forgot to tell me how many players were seated at the table. So I didn't mention that, and it actually was nine people at the table. I mentioned there was 35 people, so there's four tables, and three of them would be nine, one would be eight, but I, di I didn't specify that there's nine people at the table. He also said you forgot to specify exactly where the limper in middle position was seated. Uh, and uh, example, where was he? Was he uh, early position three, low jack, high jack? And I did not mention that. I forgot to mention that. For me, uh, in my considerations, that wasn't a big part of it. I just considered middle position. But I think for the more advanced players, it really does matter. So he was under the gun plus two at a nine-handed table. And Hunter also said, I know this is really nitpicky, but the payout structure is also relevant since you are in the money. Uh, and so the pay bump situation was uh, every nine players at this point. So uh, the player that bumped in 30, uh, from 36 down to 27, they all got paid the same. So the next pay bump was at 27 players. And we had, uh, when I say 35, we had left. And so honestly, for me, I know generally how the structure works. I know where the big money's in the top three. And at this point, I was just looking at the next pay bumps at 27, and it really wasn't very significant. And then there was another nine spots to the next pay bump, and that was at 18. So that was what I had been considering. Uh, I hadn't really been considering the entire pay structure, as I generally know, uh, you know the, the big money's in the top three. So what Hunter said is the correct play is to shove almost every time. There are three reasons why you should do this. You should assume that the limper in middle position has no malicious intentions. That is, the villain isn't limping with a big hand. Secondly, you should assume that the small blind would shove with all hands better than ace-jack because he only has about eight and a half big blinds. And thirdly, your primary objective is to force your opponents to relinquish their equity or call getting the wrong price. And so Hunter says, my advice is always to, to add more aggression to your game when the stacks are short. Now, some of the changes that would have driven a different action for Hunter uh, were stack sizes. He said, I would consider checking or raising smaller if my stack was greater than 15 big blinds. Also, knowledge of players. I would consider checking if I had seen the middle position limper trap with a big hand before. Also, our starting hand. As a default, I would shove with any pair, any ace, any suited king, and any two broadways in this spot. And then the tournament situation. I would consider checking if both opponents had me covered as we were approaching a bubble. And then just some other considerations. Uh, Hunter said, you know, in my new book, uh, and this is my decision to promote him, but uh, he's got a new book out called Advanced Concepts and No Limit Hold'em, A Modern Approach to Poker Analysis. And he does have a section called Isolation Ranges. Uh, and he said, you know, that would be a good resource for people that are looking for advice on dealing with limpers. And that's available at checkshovepoker.com backslash books. So thanks, Hunter, for that. I much appreciate it. Uh, turn now to Matt Hamilton, who I know a number of you know as well, and he's also been on the podcast. Uh, Matt just says, shove. We can assume that the middle position will open an ace-queen offsuit or better for a raise, and small blind would do the same. At worst, we would be called by a small pair and flipping. More than likely, we will pick up the blinds and antes, which are huge at this point in the tournament. Obviously, there is a chance that middle position is limping with big hands, like pocket aces, pocket kings, or ace-king, but given our stack size and the lack of information, I believe the pre-flop shove is our best option. Now, things that might change our action. If we were all deeper stacked, let's say if we were 20 big blinds or more, I would prefer a check in the big blind. Ace-jack offsuit is not strong enough to love playing out of position post-flop in a raised pot. And the majority of time, we will be forced to make some tough decisions after whiffing the flop in a potentially three-way pot, which seems disastrous. While at the same time, checking allows us to disguise our hand if we do hit a pair and go for some check raises or check calls on certain boards for value. I would say ace-queen offsuit and pocket tens or better is a good raising range in this situation, regardless of stack size when we're limped to. Let's hear from Steve Webb. Now, I think you can either fold, pre-flop, you can limp, or you can shove. I don't think I would min-raise or even 3 or 4x bet pre-flop with ace-jack because if someone shoves over the top, I think it's an easy fold, or you have to call knowing you're probably less than a coin flip. I personally would probably shove pre-flop to steal the pot that's there. If it's a guy with a huge stack who's been raising a lot or with marginal hands, I think it's a shove-and-pray situation, but we don't know that yet. 
I think if you are already in the money, there's not much difference between min cashing and anything before the final table. I personally would go for the double up to get above average starting stack. If it was close to the money bubble, I'd fold. I'm guessing first situation guy mid position had something like ace 10 and small blind has a very wide range. I would guess king 10, queen 10, jack 10, or, or something like suited connectors. All right, thanks Steve for that. I'm gonna take a quick break here just to hear from our sponsor. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack has the best poker room in Minnesota. Featuring 24 seven promos on all cash poker games, including earning $2 per hour in comps, plus the most player-friendly tourney structures. Visit runaces.com for daily promotions and the tournament calendar. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, the official sponsor of Rec Poker. All right, well, welcome back. Let's continue on uh, hearing from some of the folks that responded. Nick Crow Kramer, he says, I checked the option. Since you're new to the table, you don't know hand history and what the other players have been limping with especially the middle position guy. If you did raise, say, to sixteen to 18000 what would you do if he re-raised or shoved? I'm not a big fan of ace-jack out of position for my possible tournament life, so if you check and an ace or jack hits on the flop, you're in pretty good shape to control the pot size by check calling. I realize you only have 10 big blinds, but the average is 77000 so the majority is short-stacked. No reason to get it all in here. Overall, it's just not a pleasant spot to be in when you're at a new table. <laughs> I agree with that, Nick. Okay, Doug Behrens. He says, I need these answers first. So this is good. I mean, some of the things that I didn't, uh, didn't think to put in the situation. Doug says, how many seats are filled? What are the large stacks and small stacks at the table? What is the normal raise? How often does someone shove? Now, some of these questions, uh, it's nine-handed. Um, I, didn't, I don't know what the large and the small stacks were at the table. There were, Obviously, there were some small stacks and there were some big stacks. I was primarily concerned with those who could possibly be in the hand. So I wasn't considering that. So that's an interesting take by Doug. Uh, the normal raise and how often someone shoves, I just don't know at this table. It was a brand new table for me. So I couldn't opine on that. Then Doug asked, first to act as an old guy like me. <laughs> What's his style? And again, I, I don't know at this point. Doug says if he's very tight, he's hoping to get raised from his position and probably is, is ahead of ace jack. Lack of, no, no, I think this is interesting. Doug says lack of action after him indicates respect. How often does he enter pots? Does he commonly limp? Can we call a raise after the flop if we miss? Will our all in get him to fold pre flop? Why can this guy limp and get folded to the blinds? So even though I haven't been at the table, I think it's interesting to consider. How can he limp and nobody raises him? Is that a, an indication that perhaps he has been doing this and people have been picking up on that? Is there, is there something that I could pick up on from how the rest of the table reacts to him? Uh, what is going on with the small blind? Is he seeing the flop cheap or disguising a strong hand? Why is there no raise? So I think those are just important questions to maybe think about, even though I don't have experience, is there something that I can glean from how the table is responding to this, this guy's limp? So interesting take by Doug. Uh, Doug goes on to say, we want to go all in if we can get them to fold. You know, of course, we don't know that. Now, he says, with the facts at hand, we would like to play heads up after the flop without risking our life. Fearing the old guy will call any raise, a bet of twice the pot or a third of our stack pre-flop may get the small blind to fold. If the old guy calls, you check fold all flops you don't improve on. If he raises you, then you fold unless you want to shove for the rest of your stack. Check shoving makes no sense unless you flop two pair or a big draws. So if you check, we see a lot of folds coming. If the flop improves your hand, you shove with any ace and any jack that doesn't have a queen or a king also on the board. Doug says checking pre-flop is tempting but leads to play problems after the flop since the small blind acts first and has a bigger range than we put the old guy on. Since most flops will miss us and we think the old guy is likely to have a pair or a big ace, we will have trouble calling any action on most flops and our position sucks in this situation. Going all in pre-flop is very tempting, but we really don't need to risk our life yet and ace jack from this position is maybe behind. But even if both players are loose, aggressive and would call an all in with wide ranges, do we want to play? Good stuff, Doug. Thank you. Uh, Jason Root. Jason says shove. With effectively 13 big blinds, ace-jack is a great hand to both 3-bet shove and shove over limpers. In fact, I might shove any 2 here just for the equity alone. 
over 20,000 in this pot preflop, which is a 30% or so increase to my stack. Can't be too concerned with the small blind calling ever. They would have likely shoved over the limper to force you out with anything decent rather than risk inviting you to see a free flop in the big blind. The open limper I wouldn't be all that concerned about either. Yeah, he could end up calling you with uh, sevens, eights, or nines or something like that that he was too afraid to raise and fold with from middle position, but it's more likely he has twos through sixes or some random Broadway type hand that he's not calling off with here. So shove all day long. And if he calls with his pocket eights, fine. You're getting a great price on a flip. If he folds, you pick up tons of equity. Jason goes on to say, well, what would make you play different? Well, nothing unless you had more chips and one of the limpers had more chips. Then obviously you can put in a standard raise from the big blind and determine what to do from there. But unless I and the other players involved had over 16 big blinds, I don't see any reason to do anything but shove regardless of player type or tournament situation, except maybe in bubble situation. Then I may play different depending on stack sizes and player types, etc. Jason also said, I think once in the money, this is a prime spot to take gambles and pick up dead money. So honestly, like I mentioned, I'm shoving any two here in a tournament. If my opponents got tricky and limped with a big hand, that's fine. But going from 77,000 to nearly 100,000 at this point is really a big deal because you now have more options than shove fold. Having those extra four to five big blinds allows you to open up your game a lot because you now have a prime stack to attempt blind steals or preferably three bet shove and get folds, which will add another 30 to 40% to your stack. All right, thanks, Jason. Vic Swanson. I'm probably bumping it up to about 20,000 preflop. If I can spike an ace, I'm likely all in, whether I score one or both collars. I am feeling good with that hand and going to find out quickly if they like to just limp or if they have something worthy of seeing a flop. I think with more than two limpers, I might just call pending who the limpers are and their stack sizes. Also, with this scenario, if I am raised by one of the others in the pot, I'm not afraid to shove free flop considering I am in the money already. All right, thanks, Vic. And Jason Ackerman. This is tricky with the chip average being about 12 big blinds. It appears playing the short stack here is different than normal. I think the right play here is to check your options, see the flop, and evaluate your hand value on the flop. Everyone is short stack, so there's no need for desperation by shoving all in and getting called and being in a race or worse, dominated by a higher hand like ace queen or ace king. Even if you don't hit the flop, you may be able to bet the other two off the hand, or if they bet into you and you feel you are beat, you can always fold and play the next hand. If we were deep stacked to the level of blinds, I would raise about 3, 3x in this spot. If I were 10 or less big blinds and an average is 20 or more, and or it were still early in the tournament, I may even shove all in at this point and take my chances. Once we have gotten into the money, the next step is how do we move up the pay structure? Or even better yet, how do we put ourselves in a position to win the whole thing? All right, thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate that. Let's hear from Mike Engelhopt. Mike says, you have an 11 and a half big blind stack. This is a shove for me every time. Now there's a chance that one of these guys is trapping with a monster, but there's going to be enough times where this is not the case. Because both players are also relatively short stacked, their limps I think can be weighted more and more towards strength, or at least hands they are going to call shoves with. But I still don't care. I gotta take a shot here. The big money is up top and we gotta do what gives us the best chance of getting to the final table and with 10 or 12 big blinds we just don't have other options. Even if the opponents had monster stacks, I'm still shoving because it makes them wider and I hope they call. Here I'm probably more hoping for folds, but a call is fine too. Wouldn't be surprised if we were up against pocket fives through pocket nines, uh, ace ten, king jack, that sort of thing. Those would be dream call situations. Something to consider is your image when you make the all-in shove. Do you think a bit first? Do you act quickly? Do you appear bored or tired? Do you try to do nothing special at all? I will sometimes vary my appearance, or at least try to, if I think I can induce an action I want, but that's an in-game read. Here, because I want to seem strong, I'm not going to waste much time thinking and get my chips in the middle somewhat quickly, and then probably stare at the pot or at the table, avoiding eye contact and just being quiet. Another example shoving here with pocket aces and you want to call, I might try to appear bored or tired like I just want to get this over with and I'm mentally drained might make my opponent think I'm double up or go home mode, 
which might widen my range in his mind. All right, thanks, Mike. Appreciate uh, the extra insight there. Uh, why don't we take a quick break here once again and thank our sponsor. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack has the best poker room in Minnesota, featuring 24-7 promos on all cash poker games, including earning $2 per hour in comps, plus the most player-friendly tourney structures. Visit runaces.com for daily promotions and the tournament calendar. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, the official sponsor of Rec Poker. All right, welcome back. Let's hear from Rocky Wiley. Rocky says, with a table of nine, as this hand suggests, and you have 12 and a half big blinds into a pot of about 25, 26,000, your only real option is to just shove. I would read this action as players generally trying to see cheap flops. This deep into a tournament, it seems unlikely that they would be trying to trap pre-flop with a limp. Also, the second caller, if they had a hand already, would be more, more prone to shove themselves with a premium hand as they have roughly eight big blinds. Calling in that spot, to me, just appears weak or stupid. <laughs> I would suspect, as players are trying to ladder up, they would most likely fold to your re-raise. I think it's important to note that in the big blind, we have already committed one big blind already, leaving us with 11 and a half. Any raise leaves what's left of our stack vulnerable, and we play the rest of this hand out of position. Under these circumstances, I would absolutely shove 100% of the time. I think if my stack size were larger, I would employ a different tactic. With 18 or 20 big blinds, I'm sure I would opt for a raise as opposed to shipping. Maybe a raise of around 14 or 15,000. This also changes based on what other actions may have occurred. If the initial player had raised, for instance, I believe we get a quick understanding of where the hands actually are. The second player is forced, in my opinion, to either shove or fold. This certainly makes our decision a lot easier as well. With our original stack, if the second player shoves, I believe we must fold. And if he folds, we have to decide if our hand is worthy to ship it. Many factors come into play, like the age and appearance of our opponent. Do they seem confident or relaxed? Are they trying hard to appear confident? When, have they started talking, or what are they trying to imply by their speech? Will they make eye contact? Ace-Jack is near the lower portion of our non-paired shoving range, and this could be a spot to let it go and wait for a better time. But with 11 and a half bigs, the clock is ticking. I think if we had a 20 big blind stack, however, it does change how we would play it out. Once again, if player one raises and player two shoves, I think we are still best to just fold. I would assume player 1 is aware of player 2's chip stack. However, if player 2 limps or folds behind, we have a clear call. We are out of position and it's a spot where we don't have to make a decision for our tournament life. Also, we disguise the strength of our hand and could possibly find ourselves able to felt the player or get the full double up. If, a, if player 2 were to fold, I feel there is a stronger argument to be made for raising, but I still prefer the calling option as it gives us a good spot to check a favorable hand into the preflop aggressor without overcommitting ourselves. So that would be if we had more chips. Sweet. Thanks a ton, Mr. Y. All right, Mr. Nelson, Chris Nelson, I would push all in preflop. You already have about 10% of your stack in the pod and only a little over 10 big blinds left. You are likely in a race position at worst. Anyone with a premium hand, ace-queen, ace-king, or a large pocket pair, would likely have raised pre-flop. I would think you have the best hand at the moment. If you are called and win, it puts you in a great position to go deep in the tournament. Only a large raise pre-flop by one of the players would cause me to consider a call or a fold, but I may still go for it anyway due to your stack size. Chris Gorton. For the first scenario, I would just call and see the flop for cheap unless I was really sure they would both fold to a raise, say to 15,000. If the flop doesn't hit ace-jack or three of the ace suit, and either opponent bets post-flop, I would just fold. If neither bets, then I would bet 15,000. If I hit either the ace or the jack, then I would bet 15,000 or re-raise any other bet, unless there's three to a suit on the board. All right, let's turn it over now to Mr. Taylor Moss. Taylor says, pre-flop, I think the best play is to shove. With two limpers, we can likely, likely take away the top of their range, pocket jacks through aces and ace-king, which gives pretty decent odds should we get called. But we are looking to get folds here. With the 6k big blind and two limpers, we can increase our stack 12k plus the antes. 
This is a chance to increase our stack about 20% without showdown. The middle position limper seems like the only concern if they are actually holding a hand. With the small blind behind them, they likely would fold the majority of their hands as it's hard to call a middle pair knowing that you might go three ways. The small blind limping seems really weak in my opinion. With a 10 big blind stack or less, I'm guessing they are just shoving any sort of good hand. So a shove into them will be highly profitable. My action changes could be affected by history on the players if we had any. It would have to be a strong read that the middle position has never limped before. Or small blind has limped with strong holdings. I would have to have a strong read that they might be slow playing something to not shove and instead try to see a flop. Sweet. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, Rob Washam says, As nitty as this sounds, I would check my option. We have no information on our opponents, and we don't have the stack depth to be splashing around, and we are out of position. At this point, chips lost are more valuable than chips won. Our current stack depth is less than 12 big blinds. But if we were sitting with 30 big blinds or more, we should punish the limbers and raise to 3.5 big blinds. If we knew for a fact that our two opponents were fit or fold types, we could even put a raise from a 20 or 30 big blind stack. We should be prepared to get aggressive on anything we connect with, any ace or jack, and I would probably open jam the flop. We could check and hope for a bet and then raise all in, as this would show more strength and earn us more chips. But without knowing the players, we can't count on the flop bet from the middle position. The average chip stack is only 13 big blinds. Do we have real short stacks at our table? If so, it would be a shame to punt away our chance to outlast them. As always, good stuff, Rob. All right, let's hear from Joe Bernard. Joe says, raise to 69K or all in. Now, this is interesting. 69K is not all in. So he's saying either raise to 69K or all in. We raise to 69K in case there's a pay jump in the next couple of spots so we can wait a few moments to see if someone else will bust before us. The 13,500 in the middle is very valuable, and this is a great spot to pick it up uncontested by effectively moving all in. The only time this maneuver would be unprofitable if, is, is if the middle position player is limping exclusively monsters, pocket queens through aces and ace king. It is pretty rare for someone to trap with a limp off of a 15 big blind stack, and as soon as they start adding any lesser combinations that have to fold, or weaker limp calling hands, then shoving ace-jack offsuit becomes extremely profitable. The small blind should virtually never have a better hand, so his limp is basically dead money. We are in the money and not worried about busting because we have a ways to go before serious pay bumps, and we would like to take any profitable opportunity to increase our stack in hopes of making a run at the final table. Ace-jack offsuit is a slam dunk in this spot, but I think it's very important to evaluate the middle position's limp. Is he limping and folding to a jam very often? Is he trapping sometimes or calling with some of his better limps? This can be tough to do, especially when you're given a new table, but it's our job as a poker player to try our best to make sense of our opponent's strategy. Oftentimes, our assumptions can be wrong, but they are all that we have to go by. If he is folding to an effective shove often enough, it may be profitable to shove any two. However, that takes some pretty strong assumptions about our opponent's strategy. I would be comfortable shoving here with pocket fives and higher, ace eight suited and higher, ace jack offsuit and higher, king nine suited and higher, king queen offsuit, queen ten suited and better, jack nine suited and ten nine suited. Good stuff as always, Mr. Bernard. All right, let's turn it over to Schneids, Mr. Mike Schneider. Mike says, I personally prefer an all-in shove here. There is roughly 19,000 in dead chips in the pot, and with 70K chips of our own, I feel like it's quite likely we can get a 27% gain to our chip stack without having to see a flop to do so. That kind of chip gain is huge in this stage of the tournament. It is almost a given that the small blind doesn't have a hand that can call our all-in considering he has only 50k and tried to see a flop cheaply. And although I stereotype a 60-year-old guy as being a lot more likely to limp a huge hand here than say a 25-year-old guy with sunglasses and a hoodie, if we say he is capable of limp calling with any of pocket 7s or better or ace-jack or better, we still have about 35% equity the times we do get called, which means we don't have to take down the pot all that often uncontested to make this a positive EV pre-flop shove. 
thanks to the equity, equity that we still maintain the times we do get called. I prefer to, to attack as many uncontested chips as possible, and I think this is a prime spot to quite frequently succeed at doing so. Mike says that my thought process on this might change if all players are deeper stacked than 9 to 15 big blinds, or if we have first-hand knowledge that the middle position limper is one who often limps really strong holdings to try to trap people. Likewise, if this was a big bubble spot where the next bust means a huge jump in payout, I would be more primed to just want to see the flop. Although, that too is situational, and if I believe both other players are going to be playing ultra super tight to try to move up in the payout or, or not bubble or whatever, then I will again be in attack mode due to wanting to capitalize on their fears. All right, good stuff, Mike. Well, here's, uh, here's the thoughts that I had going through uh, this process, actually being in that situation after a long day of, of playing poker. Here's how I thought about it. I did think that most players are not going to limp right there with a huge hand. Uh, now, I didn't know this guy at all. I just moved to the table, but I thought most people are not going to do that. Uh, usually, the limping would be by uh, some kind of a small to mid pair, maybe two Broadway cards, maybe suited connectors and gappers. Uh, personally, I don't like this sort of speculating this late in the tournament with small pairs or suited connectors and gappers, but uh, for some people, I think they continue to speculate with those. Um, and although I can't take those out of the range, I would tend to think this is something like uh, Ace Jack, Ace 10, King Queen, King Jack, King 10, Queen Jack, maybe Queen 10, and Jack 10, as well as something like Pocket 8s through Pocket 10s. Uh, and those are sort of this half set mining, half looking for an overpair. Uh, sort of situation. And while I can't eliminate them, I tend to underweight the possibility of pocket jacks through aces, ace king, and ace queen, as I would clearly expect those to be raises at this stage of the tournament. Uh, so we have 35 people left, and the next pay jump is at 27. So basically, the next seven people all get the same pay. And also, the, the next pay jump is, is really not that significant, uh, and it's another nine people until you get to the next pay jump. So really, you got to get to the final 10 before you really start seeing some potential for some big money. So I don't want to punt off the stack, but I want uh, to be opportunistic. And there's no immediate mistake by busting here versus lasting just a few more spots. So I decided that I had enough chips to have significant fold equity against most hands that are in his limping range and still some equity against most of his limping range, uh, especially if I think I can take out the, the big pairs. So I decided to shove and try to bring an increase to my stack at, at this critical juncture. Uh, he had pocket kings and he busted me. Now, as I've assessed the situation, I'm still pretty comfortable with this decision. I tend to not be results oriented. I want to look at what was the right decision in this case. I'm still pretty comfortable. I do have a little bit of regret um, and I wondered if I needed to shove to accomplish what I was hoping to accomplish. Uh, now, I wanted to maximize fold equity, but I think what I did was force my opponents to play optimally. He was only going to call with probably pocket jacks or better or ace king, and all of those are pretty far ahead of me. Um, I guess I guess I could get some folds from he hands like uh, ace queen, which is better than me, and maybe some, some of those hands that I'd be flipping against, pocket tens and lower. But I wonder, you know, what if I had raised to 18,000 or even 24,000? Um, now, certainly I have less fold equity against some of the hands, but I could have taken that line. And then if I get shoved on pre-flop, I know that I was set up and I can still fold with 50000 or so left. Now, the math might say I should call because of how much I've invested, but if I know I'm crushed, I can still have 50,000 chips. I still have about eight big blinds, which isn't great, but I'm still in the tournament. So I just wonder if, if that's the case. And if I had raised and he just flatted me pre-flop, then I could decide to either just shove any flop or anything that looked like maybe it matched well with my range. Now he could still be trapping me, but I don't think he would trap there with pocket kings pre-flop. So uh, that's my one consideration. I was wondering if I had just raised some and been willing to fold to a shove. But that seems like uh, I'm not getting the fold equity that I really want in this situation. So kind of the question for me is where is that optimal range where I'm getting significant fold equity, getting enough fold equity to possibly take the pot right there, but not putting my opponent in a place to play optimally and only call me with a hand that crushes me. But anyway, I don't know. So I appreciate the fantastic feedback. This is super helpful for my game. Hopefully this is super helpful for all of you who are out there 
thinking about these same decisions and wrestling with the same uh, decisions. It's good to get different perspectives on what people are thinking about. I want to thank, again, everybody who provided input today. I appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. Also, hats off to Running Aces, the official sponsor of the Rec Poker Podcast, as well as the Free Poker Network. Now, if you don't have a podcast app or you're getting them directly from SoundCloud or iTunes, there's another option. Uh, There is a Rec Poker page now on the Running Aces website. So if you just go to runaces.com slash rec poker, we've got the latest episodes out there. We've got some... uh, some text out there about the thing. We'll put the hand situation out there so you can go out there and read all about it. So uh, it's another way for you to, to access this uh, and then check out the rest of the uh, Running Aces website while you're out there. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Join the Facebook group. Email me, stevefredland at gmail.com if you have any input uh, or if you want to be part of the group that's providing feedback on these hand situations. So let me know what you think. Until next week, adios. Adios.